Hello, I'm Peter Graves. Welcome to Biography. Most business leaders shun the spotlight. Our subject tonight does not. Donald Trump has shaped the skyline of the nation's largest city, and he has shaped tabloid headlines around the world. He became one of the world's richest men, almost lost it all, and has come back once again. Donald Trump owns casinos, luxury hotels, and some of the most expensive buildings anywhere. His most important asset may be his ability to see on a huge scale the potential of something as simple as a vacant lot. Now, Biography examines the life of Donald Trump. News from the business world. A remarkable comeback for Donald J. Trump, the Big Apple tycoon who enjoyed Midas-like successes in the glitzy 1980s and whose larger-than-life personality was on constant display. He loves having beautiful women and beautiful cars and beautiful palaces, and he loves being known as the Donald, and he loves being that person. The breakup between Donald and Ivana was something that had been going on for years, and I think our relationship just happened after that had already lost its track. For Trump, the beautiful things, the financial success seemed to be lost. His business collapsed at the same time his personal life exploded. But Trump fought his way back in an astonishing comeback. When you see all this, and then when people come up to you and grab at you and touch you and this and that, did I ever think it was going to be like that? No. In my wildest dreams, I never thought it was going to be like that. Donald was the middle child of five, born in 1946 to a pair of romantics. Right after Fred Trump first set his eyes on Mary McLeod, he had rushed home to tell his mother he'd met the girl with whom he would spend the rest of his life. They married in 1936. With a family quickly growing, Fred Trump began building his fortune by constructing homes in Brooklyn and Queens for GIs returning from World War II. Though the family became quite wealthy, Fred and Mary Trump would insist that their children succeed both at school and at work. Donald Trump would exceed his parents' wildest expectations, following the path paved by his father. He learned at the feet of a master, and uh, there was always business being discussed in terms of how you build a building, uh, you know, how you get approvals, those types of things. The learning wasn't just from watching. The Trump children were all required to work starting as teenagers. Though Fred Trump had built a mini empire in Queens, he brought his children up to believe that what they earned was vital to the family. It was Fred Trump's way of teaching them to respect the value of money. The girls worked in banks or in local department stores. The boys worked with their father, doing everything from sanding floors to hauling lumber. And I watched, and, and it wasn't that I even watched consciously. I'd be sitting on the floor playing with blocks as a three-year-old baby, and he'd be on the floor talking to contractors about price and elevators and wood. And, you know, I mean, and by the time I'm 16 years old, I sort of, like, knew everything about building buildings, and I never studied, but I knew everything about it. I think that what Donald got from his father was the disciplines of hard work, and uh, you're not born uh, a builder. You learn to be a builder. Young Donald Trump was, in fact, not much of a student. He preferred to spend his days playing ball. And it was in this sport that Donald tasted his first success. But like all kids his age, Donald wanted a new baseball mitt. They could easily have afforded one, but Fred Trump said no on principle. He came home and he said to my father, Peter, blank, has a baseball mitt that costs $45. I want one, too. Of course, my father's standard answer was, of course you can't have that. You won't appreciate anything when you grow up if you have it now. Of course, he didn't get a $45 baseball in. If young Donald learned that it took hard work to get money for expensive baseball gloves and other luxuries, he wasn't learning much in school. In fact, he'd become more than a handful for his teachers, throwing chalk and erasers at them just to see their reactions. And his troublemaking wasn't confined to the schoolroom. Donald's older brother and sister couldn't wait for their parents to leave the house so they could get even. But he had a way on occasion of uh, driving you nuts. Uh, and one Saturday night, I remember, he was sitting at the dining room table and there was a bowl of mashed potatoes on the table. And uh, 
Donald went through one of his um, you know, cute little performances like nin, 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 and my brother Fred picked up the bowl of mashed potatoes and flung them across the table and Donald had mashed potatoes coming out of his eyes and his nose. Donald's parents decided what their 13-year-old son needed was more discipline, so they sent him to military school. The instructors at New York Military Academy wouldn't stand for unpolished boots, much less throwing of erasers. One of Donald's first tasks was learning to march. Uh, if he didn't do it right, he had to do 20 push-ups with the rest of them. Uh, if he didn't do his manual of arms correctly, he had to double time the perimeter with the rifle. Trump, nicknamed DT, began to flourish, even excel at the academy. Among his many awards was one for neatness, and he was promoted steadily within his cadet company to commander of the honor guard. In uniform, he led the cadet company in the Columbus Day Parade down Fifth Avenue, past buildings he would one day own. The shrapnel, the yearbook of the New York Military Academy, contained one more notation about DT. It was something that would later seem quite ironic. He was voted ladies' man. That is the vote by his classmates. Donald Trump was a tall drink of water, I used to call him. Uh, blonde hair, good-looking, clean-cut American kid. And when the girls used to come up on Sundays, why, you know, they would all uh, know who Donald Trump is. But Donald's biggest love at the time was still baseball. He was captain of the military academy team. At the state championship finals, the score was tied 2-2 with two out in the final inning. Donald Trump was up next. It would be the most important at-bat of the season. And this was our last game of the, of the season. And we had a man on third, two out. Trump came up to the plate. And he hit a ball to right field. He was a light swing on that one. So the kid scored from third. He went down the first, and he was jumping up and down with joy. Trump was scouted by the major leagues, but never would be seen on a baseball card. He passed up his chance at pro ball for college, Fordham, and Wharton School of Business. After graduation, everyone expected Donald to join his father's company, but his dreams were not of middle-class developments in Queens. Donald Trump was looking across the East River into the skies of Manhattan at a skyline he would one day change. His first bold move would come as he applied one of his father's lessons, which would become his formula for success. Buy when a property and its owner are in distress, then turn the place around. The diamond in the rough that caught Donald's eye was on the most famous street in New York City, 42nd Street. I mean, he asked, told me what he had in mind for the Commodore, asked my opinion, and I basically told him he was crazy. In 1974, at the height of New York City's financial crisis, Trump started talking with the bankrupt Penn Central Railroad about the seedy Commodore Hotel above Grand Central Station. At age 28, when most people would be worrying about buying a house, Trump was pushing a concept that seemed impossible using a combination of family money, $45 million in loans, and a proposed tax break to finance his first deal. You were going to sell the city to give up their taxes, to be, be a partner in a new hotel. You were going to convince the, the state that they ought to come in also and be part of it. Uh, you were going to convince somebody like Hyatt that they ought to put their name on a hotel, which at that time, the Commodore, you have to remember, was closed and there was a massage parlor on the second floor. And somehow this was going to end up to be a, a, an economic success. The Commodore Project's biggest difficulty turned out not to be permits or financing, but the building itself. In addition to its bad reputation, the Commodore had tiny rooms, poor ventilation, and structural problems. This made it doubly tough on Trump. His plan, which he'd reuse in virtually all his development proposals, was to rebuild the Commodore into what he calls a world-class luxury property. Donald hired the best architects and the best engineers and say, good, don't tell me it can't be done, tell me how it can be done. It's a classic example of when you're young, sometimes you're not smart enough to know that something can't be done. And Donald never for a second thought it couldn't be done. And he made it happen. The Commodore Project, which sparked a turnaround in midtown New York City, also led to Trump meeting the first of two women who would become key factors in his early life. Norma Ferderer was hired as Trump's personal assistant. He's tough. He is tough. And he's demanding. But you know what? 
You don't think on, of it on a day-to-day -day issue because he is so effective on what he's doing and you understand what he's doing and you want to be a part of it. Trump would meet the other woman, a model who lived in Canada, when he went to watch the Olympics in Montreal. Ivana Winklemeyer Zilnikova was her name. She was three years younger than he and had been an alternate on the Czechoslovakian ski team in 1972. In 1977, one year after they met, she and Trump would marry and become partners in business as well as at home. And when we got married, I came from Montreal. Then I used to work as a model for 10 years and uh, I got pregnant. I know the people. I was bored and Donald put me into the construction of the building and then into the designing and I got involved very, very much and I enjoyed those years. The Trumps would have three children, Donald Jr., Ivanka and Eric. And for years, they would lead the kind of life of which most can only dream as the Trump empire grew. We started young couple, like maybe not like everybody else because uh, Donald wasn't from the poor family. But Donald started 10 years ago with almost nothing and he really built billion dollar empire and I'm very proud of him. In 1981, Trump formally established the Trump Organization, an umbrella company for his deals. Just one year later, a skyscraper would rise on Fifth Avenue with a dazzling pink marble atrium and two-foot-high gold letters announcing the arrival of a new real estate mogul. The building was called Trump Tower, and with the 80s boom in full swing, Donald Trump was on his way. First, there was the Trump Tower. The Trump Plaza, a $125 million residential tower, would soon rise a few blocks away. The success of these projects left Donald Trump with a sizable fortune. He and Ivana soon began a string of acquisitions that dazzled and amazed even the most jaded. They'd add to their list of homes Mar-a-Lago, the legendary 118-room Palm Beach estate built in the 1920s by the post Serial family. The Trumps bought it from the federal government for $5 million in 1985, knowing it had a million-dollar-a-year maintenance bill. There was the Trump Princess acquired that same year for $30 million. But the Trump's first new purchase was a $3.7 million mansion in Greenwich, Connecticut, even though the Trump's planned to live in New York City in a 50-room $10 million apartment they'd carved out of the top three floors of the Trump Tower. The things Trump bought were all unique, like his construction projects. Still, the most astonishing thing about Trump's new buildings wasn't that they stood out so much from the rest of the architecture in Manhattan. It was the prices he was asking for the apartments in his towers, all of which bore his name. If, if you get a building with Trump's name on it, uh, you will get more per square foot. That's why people come to him. He does it with the same method he gets the publicity. Because your publicity, you get fame, and if you get fame, you say, I live in one of Mr. Trump's buildings. Well, that wouldn't mean anything if Mr. Trump wasn't famous. So he gets himself famous in order to be a better marketer. I tend to create things that sell. I think my greatest strength is knowing what people want, knowing what to create, and then having an ability to get it done. If Trump had become the brand name for the high end of the Manhattan residential market, Trump had also become feared among his competitors, and he wasn't easy on the people who worked for him either. It's such a great disappointment to him when someone really doesn't measure up. And, um, I, and that's sort of like the beginning of the end, if you, know, if you really blow it, but good, from, out of sheer stupidity. Donald does not take prisoners. Donald sees business as a war. Uh, it's not a playground. He has a lot of fun, but there's only one end result in a battle, and that is winning. He likes fights, he likes the idea of the, the combat in the center of a ring where two people have nothing but ability that they lay on the line. Nobody can accomplish a result through politics or uh, anything other than their native-born skills. No, he's not a good old Don. I never take anything from granted, no. Don is just a wonderful human being. He's giving and he's warm. A lot of people, they look at him as a tough businessman, which he is. But Don, is, if you're good to him, he's good to you. If you're not good to him, you're dead. Because <laughs> sooner or later, he outsmarts you somewhere. Donald Trump's empire expanded at an astonishing pace in the heady 1980s. As his net worth leaped from the millions into the billions, Trump suddenly was not just a developer, he was a true celebrity. More than followed, he was mobbed by television cameras and photographers. 
virtually every time he went out in public. He was red hot. He was on a roll. There was no question about it. He was on a roll, and, and everybody that was involved in the financial end thought he was on a roll and was ready to back his play. I remember once riding in a, in a helicopter with him up to the Milton Bradley Company, I believe it was, the game company, when they were making his board game. And we were, we were landing, and the people, uh, the employees were out in the, on the lawn with their autograph books and their snapshot cameras. And as the, the helicopter was coming down, the wind was blowing them and ruffling the pages of their autograph books. And, you know, I remember Donald saying, this is great, Charlie, isn't it? Trump clearly knew how to make headlines. When the city of New York under Mayor Ed Koch ran into huge cost overruns and embarrassing years of delay refurbishing the rundown Wallman skating rink in Central Park, Trump stepped in. He said he'd do the job for cost and do it in time for the 1987 skating season. 90 days, and the city would have taken nine years to do what he did in 90 days. The Wallman rink, I think, had been under construction for three years, and I think the city had spent $11 million, and they had nothing. And for under $4 million, he had it opened and I think there was some excess money which they used to build the refreshment area. But I give Ed Koch and Commissioner Henry Stern tremendous credit for having the courage to say, Donald, go and do it. And it would have been probably a lot better for them if I didn't do it. But the truth is, for three and a half months, they have been nothing but helpful. Thank you. You just saw the modest Donald Trump. <laughs> but Donald Trump deserves an enormous amount of credit, and I am delighted in my capacity as mayor of the city of New York to thank him on behalf of the seven and a half million people who live here. The public truce between the mayor and the developer would not last. Trump was soon seeking city consent for a new project and not getting it. I'm saying that Ed Koch could do everybody a huge favor if he got out of office and if they started all over again. He's squealing like a uh, stuck pig. No, I would say he's got no talent and, and only moderate in intelligence. Suddenly, people started wondering if Trump might be interested in running for office. His book, The Art of the Deal, was published. It spent 32 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. Trump was invited to speak in New Hampshire at a time when candidates were combing the state looking for votes in the presidential primary. Trump took out a series of newspaper ads declaring positions on political issues, some of them quite controversial at the time. A draft Trump for president movement was started. But when he went to the 1988 Republican convention, interviewed on NBC, Donald Trump was supporting George Bush but preserving his options. Well, I do feel very strongly about the country. I love the country, but I think you're going to have probably George Bush as your next president. He's an excellent guy, an excellent man. He's a friend of mine, and I'm here for that reason. Well, well I wasn't talking about this year, Mr. Trump, but you have said that if you ran for president, you'd win. I think I'd have a very good chance. I mean, I like to win. When I do something, I like to win. I like to, uh, I like to do well, and I think I probably would have a pretty good chance. But the economic situation of the country was changing, even as Donald Trump was expanding. Though he applied his old formula, buy a valuable property when its owner's in big trouble and needs to sell cheap, not all of his deals would work out. If you would have told me a year ago that I'd ever have the opportunity to own such a wonderful asset, I really would have said, it just can't happen. Donald Trump purchased bankrupt Eastern Airlines shuttle. He renamed it the Trump Shuttle. He started a football team called the New Jersey Generals in a new league. There was a TV game show called Trump Card. All flopped. Still, these would be relatively minor setbacks. Trump's biggest new foray was into Atlantic City gambling. He acquired the struggling Harris property, renaming it the Trump Plaza, and opening it in May of 1984. One year later, he picked up a failing Hilton project, spending $320 million to get the Trump castle going. Ivana Trump was installed as its chief executive officer for a salary of $1 per year. Though she had to compete against their own Trump Plaza and cut into its business, by 1987, both hotels were solidly profitable, ranking number two and number four in town. Atop that, Trump was already mounting a running corporate battle that would land him the biggest distressed property of them all, the Taj Mahal. The project had virtually sunk Resorts International. It had five years and $500 million invested in the still uncompleted hotel. The Taj would come close to sinking Donald Trump, too, and then, in an astonishing turnaround, bail him out. 
But as Trump overextended himself financially with the Atlantic City Ventures and other acquisitions like the Plaza Hotel in New York City, the Trump problem that would become the most visible had quietly begun growing. Trump had met a young model named Marla Maples in 1985. Just a quick hello, how are you? And I'd seen him at a few different functions in the city at different occasions, and it was always very warm and very nice, and, and that was it. There was an affection, but but never thought of it as being anything more at that point. Donald Trump was atop the business and real estate worlds. He had built towers, owned the Plaza Hotel, bought financier Adnan Khashoggi's yacht, renaming it the Trump Princess. He'd also moved heavily into the gambling industry. And though his next move seemed logical at the time, Trump now says it led to trouble. He named his wife Ivana to run the Trump Castle Casino. And I sent her down to Atlantic City to run a casino. And she did a very good job. The problem was that's all she wanted to talk about. She wanted to talk about the business. Now, I don't blame her. But when I got home at 7 o'clock and I left at 8 in the morning or 7 in the morning, I really didn't want to come home and talk about the wind numbers at Trump's castle. I really wanted to just relax and be with my wife. My wife and helper and uh, a lady of very good taste. So I, I'm very happy. I'm very happy to have her. She keeps, she keeps me toned down a little bit. I'm very fortunate because Donald gave me fantastic opportunity. He didn't give me chance. He gave me opportunity. And if I couldn't do it, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here for a month or two months. Ivana would be transferred to the Plaza Hotel after it was acquired with the same dollar-a-year salary. Donald joked she also got all the dresses she could buy. But Trump says his biggest problem with the marriage hadn't changed. I moved her over to the Plaza Hotel, and it was really more of the same. I mean, we were talking about business, how the hotel's doing, what we're doing. And, and you know, beyond 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I didn't want to do it. It became more of a business relationship than a family relationship or a wife-husband relationship. The strains on the marriage came at the same time as the near total collapse of the real estate market. In the midst of it, Trump was rocked by sudden tragedy. One of his helicopters crashed, killing three of his hand-picked senior executives, men who had become his friends. Trump himself had considered making the trip. He also talked a lot about fate. I think that he was supposed to go on that trip and he didn't at the last minute for whatever reason, so I think he appreciated how lucky he was. He also, of course, appreciated how unfortunate it was to those people and their families, uh, but he was shaken by it. The, the helicopter crash made him realize that how fragile life was and that how you have to, you can't postpone happiness and that you have to uh, do what you, make the adjustments that you need to to, to find happiness now and that probably had some effect on, on, on hurrying up his decision to end the marriage with Ivana. A January 1990 interview Trump gave Playboy magazine might also have had an effect. When asked if he was monogamous, Trump said no comment. Trump had been a master at getting his name in the newspapers with stories about his amazing successes in business. But now he was being written about in the gossip columns instead of the Wall Street Journal, being linked with a series of actresses and models. His personal life became troubled. Uh, he and Ivana had a falling out. Uh, Mike Tyson, the fighter who he backed, got knocked out in Tokyo. That happened really over the same weekend. So the news, in one sense, was always bad. Uh, the airline business was being uh, was going undergoing tough times. He owned a part of that. The hotel business was undergoing tough times. Atlantic City was undergoing tough times. All these places where Donald had a finger in the, in the pie were, were strained by a, by a changing economy. There was another change, too. Though he'd been linked to other women, Trump had started to see Marla Maples, a young unknown actress who would become his second wife. Well, I think I was very much too close to that because of, of his personal situation mm -hmm. at that time. That was off, always known as off limits to me. <laughs> Fate kept tempting it, let's put it that way. You know, I couldn't fight it, believe me. I tried, and he tried for many years to fight the connection that we have. And I think when you have a, a bond with another person, sometimes you just have to see it through and see what it's about. Or it keeps coming back in your face over and over again. The relationship was really in the face of Ivana Trump. When photos of Donald and Marla almost together at a boxing match Trump was promoting hit the supermarket tabloids, she said nothing. 
But then at Christmas, there was a confrontation in Aspen, Colorado. Star Magazine came up with photos of Maples, Trump, and Ivana, and other photos showed a gloomy Trump with Ivana. February 11th, it hit the headlines. It would be the most public divorce in decades. Yeah, there was a period when, when Donald and Ivana seemed to have each have access to their own gossip columnists in New York City, and they, they were each playing them, seemed to be playing them off against each other. Liz Smith was the one who had the a story from Ivana's side of it. And uh, Donald probably didn't talk that much from his side of it. And around dinner tables all over New York, they were saying, and maybe all over America, they were saying, do you think Ivana will take him back? Will he marry Marla? This was the talk, the table talk of the nation for, for a while. And the funny thing was, I would go in to the office, and there would be the real Donald Trump, and he'd say, Charles, do you think Ivana will take me back? What do you think will happen? Do you think I should, you know, do you think I should marry Marla? Or, or words to that effect. He'd be, Donald is a great, he asks everyone's opinion about things. He doesn't always listen to the answer, but he asks them. Now, the explanations are easier. Back then, reporters were on the trail of all three. Ivana was mobbed going into a Valentine's Day birthday party. Marla was tracked down to a Long Island hideout provided by a Trump associate. Donald, who was out in public, seemed to get it from all sides. I'm uh, shocked to see so much press. I know the only thing they want to do is discuss the tour to Trump today. <laughs> and to me, one of the most important things is his uh, love affair with New York City. The most amazing part of it was that as major world stories were breaking, it was the Trump divorce that dominated the headlines. I can remember literally sitting in a corner, crying my eyes out, wondering how to get up and just feed myself. I was watching my very beautiful private relationship become very public and very ugly, and that was very frightening. I never left Ivana because of Marla, but that's something that's like unknown because a lot of people thought I did or hoped I did, and it sounds a little bit sexier in the papers to write that I did, but I never left Ivana for Marla. The glittering world of Donald and Ivana, a world of yachts, champagne and black tie, the fabulous properties, the huge Florida home called Mar-a-Lago, to the public it seemed perfect. But the real Donald Trump, it turned out, wasn't that kind of guy. Though he's told me that one of the reasons that he and Ivana eventually divorced is that he couldn't bear that life one more second, that going to parties every night and getting home and putting on a tuxedo and doing this. He was happy sitting home uh, on an evening, watching television, having a little spaghetti and meatballs. And that's it. I, I really don't think deep down he is a pate kind of guy. I can buy anything I want, but I love where I came from. I love the foods that I grew up eating. When I go to French restaurants and get the best tables and get the phony waiters with the phony accents, and then they give you a plate that's this big and has a tiny piece of pheasant on it with gravy, and the gravy is in 19 different colors and 19 different shades and 13 different vegetables, all of which you hate. And you're supposed to tell this owner or maitre d' what a fabulous meal you had because it's the hottest restaurant in New York, one of 12. And then they give you the bill and the bill's $143 for the one meal. And you say, am I missing something? One thing Trump never missed was a chance to heighten his celebrity status, which at times rivaled the world's top entertainers, many of whom played at Trump's casinos. In public, people just wanted to get close to Donald Trump. Good morning, Donald. How are you? Are you okay? Can I shake your hand? Are you all right? Yes, I am, dear. Yeah. It leads to one of the more revealing asides about Trump's character. He's really not that happy about having to shake so many people's hands. It's very often you hear about people who are germ freaks and they're like Howard Hughes, someone who hasn't bathed in, in three weeks and has 12 inch fingernails and all. Donald's certainly not like that, but he's very fastidious and very uh, cleanliness oriented. I'm a cleanliness freak. I love washing my hands before I eat. And you go to a restaurant and you wash your hands and you sterilize everything and the water's nice and hot and then you wash them and again. And then you go to the table and you sit down. And a guy walks out and he says, hey, Mr. Trump, how you doing? I'm a fan of yours. And he sticks out his hand, and then four or five other people come out. Now, the only good thing is you tend not to eat as much. One thing Trump clearly loves, as much as he did in his early days, is the media spotlight. But that leads to more people wanting to shake his hand. 
Sometimes you're not in the mood to shake hands with everybody and to say hello to everybody, and you really just don't want to do it. But at the same time, you know that if it ever stops, that's a bad sign because that means you're not there anymore. That means it's over. For a while in 1990, it seemed it would be over. Trump's financial troubles had exploded, and combined with his personal problems, the front pages chronicled a spiraling decline. Trump had built his empire by borrowing huge sums of money, and in June of 1990, he didn't have the cash to make $73 million in interest payments on the loans, including payments on bonds covering the Trump Castle Casino. The banks put Trump on what was for him an almost humiliating budget, $450,000 a month in 1990, $375,000 in 1991, and $300,000 a month for 1992. And the banks demanded he hire a new financial officer. In exchange, he was given enough money to stay out of bankruptcy court. But that wasn't enough to save him. In November, he missed payments to the bondholders at the Taj Mahal Casino. With the Casino Control Commission demanding proof of financial stability, Trump was forced to battle literally 24 hours a day just to stay afloat. I'll never forget having to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, one morning, and it was snowing and like sleet coming down. It was freezing. It was horrible. And I had to go out to a bank and literally go to a bank where groups of people were working on my account and, and really working hard. And I was calling other parts of the world to talk to bank presidents about my loans. If Trump was battling to stay afloat in an ocean of debt, his new relationship with Marla Maples was equally stormy. And their breakups would be chronicled in the newspapers with headlines as big as when Trump and Ivana had split. So sometimes there was a real battle going on. It, it didn't work right. You know, it just did not come together the way we would wish it would. So that was a very difficult time um, because it was blown up in such a huge way that affected every single player. You know, we broke up a few times because it, it was just... It was, it was a wrong time for me to have a relationship. At the same time, it was also great knowing that there was somebody there. And she was there, and she was there like nobody I've ever seen. I mean, the level of loyalty was great. And it wasn't like she was being treated so great. He would say to me many times, I just got sprung. I don't know what to do. I love her, but I just got sprung. When he and Marla broke up, he had a huge Christmas party right here, and it was filled with models and celebrities and this and that and the other thing. And you think, well, and the very next day, he was downstairs in the Edwardian room or the Palm Court or somewhere having brunch with Marla for Christmas. I the only offer Maples accepted at the time was to do a series of ads for a brand of jeans famous for hiring the other woman. That's a state of our environment. A brand called No Excuses. Playboy magazine offered me $2 million to pose. And, and it, hey, Donald might have even liked that. But, but that was something that it just wasn't in my makeup to do that. And every time we broke up, I was left with nothing. Um, I was so enwrapped in the relationship that I wasn't able to go out and create money on my own. Well, she never bad-mouthed him to the press. She'd say, well, I love him and I'm praying for him and I hope that, it, you know, everything works out. He's a wonderful man. I mean, now, I would have been throwing tomatoes at the camera and saying, that son of a bitch, I'll kill him, but not her. What was killing Trump at the time was the continuing recession, which bordered on a depression in the industries in which he had all his money. Newspapers would report four bankruptcies among Trump's properties. Trump canceled an order for a new $210 million yacht, which was to replace the Trump princess, and sold the Dutch shipyard he'd bought to build it. He tried not to show it, but he was at his lowest point. I was walking down the street with Marla, Fifth Avenue, and there was a man in front of Tiffany, and he was holding a can, and I said to Marla, do you know that man is wealthier than me? And she looked at me, she said, what are you talking about? I said, that man across the street is worth $900 million more than me at this very moment. And she said, I don't understand it. He's not worth $900 million. I said, no, let's assume he's worth nothing. I'm worth minus $900 million. Donald Trump faced a desperate cash crunch and an emotional crunch simultaneously. 
The business crisis came to a head when a major international gambler showed up at the Taj Mahal wanting to bet $12 million on a Baccarat game. It was a tough time and it was, a, you know, it really uh, de defeats the meaning of the word gambling hall. Ga gambling hall is a euphemism. That's what the players do, not the house. The house is supposed to be. Well, it went on for three days. We were up six million, then he won the six back, then we were down eight. I mean, certainly Donald was calling every half an hour, 200,000 hands. At 14 million an hour, 70 hands an hour were going across that table. It wasn't until much later that the public learned how close Trump had come to not being able to keep his casinos afloat. And it was Donald Trump's father who'd come to the rescue. Fred Trump put $3 million on the line, buying chips, then walking out of the casino. Though Trump would eventually be fined for taking what amounted to an illegal loan under the rules of the Casino Control Commission, it was a revitalizing vote of confidence. When you owe billions and billions, three million doesn't mean a lot in one sense, but in one sense it means an awful lot. But it was sort of a sign of confidence. When I was in trouble, people would go up to my father that maybe didn't dig me or didn't like me or didn't anything. But they sort of say, hey, your son's in trouble, and, and they'd say it in a gloating way. And he'd go and say, and I'll never forget it, and he'd tell this to everybody, bet your entire ranch on the fact that Donald comes back stronger than he ever was before. You can retreat and go away and give up, or you can fight harder than you've ever fought before. And, and I really uh, took my eye off the ball for a while, and I blame myself. I don't blame a real estate depression. I don't blame anybody. I took my eye off the ball, and I got it back on the ball, and I went back to doing business the way I used to do it and really focused, and, um, and it just worked out. It didn't really just work out. 1991 and 92 saw Trump trying to reduce his staggering debt. He dumped properties like the failing Trump shuttle, sold off interests in some of his major holdings, and was forced to sell the Trump princess, one of the symbols of his early success. For the highly visible tycoon, who for a while seemed to have the Midas touch, it was a sobering process. And he'll make a decision. And once the decision's made, I've never seen him agonize over anything too much. Even if it didn't work out for the best, he then makes the next decision. Do we sell this off? Do we try to improve it? Do we try to manage it better? One thing Trump couldn't seem to manage was his tempestuous relationship with Marla Maples. After his divorce from Ivana, the couple went out in public together. Maples took a role dancing in the Will Rogers Follies on Broadway, and then in April 1993, a story hit the newspapers that would once again bounce world problems off the front page. Donald and his unmarried girlfriend were expectant parents. Are we, are we getting married? And if so, when? Who said we're not? <laughs> that day, Trump and Marla met with reporters, but wouldn't say if they had plans to wed. But managing better was a critical factor in turning Trump's battered finances around. The executives who work for him either succeeded and got rich, or they found out that his management style is not all that gentle. If they're not doing their job, I yell. If they're not doing their job, sometimes it creates the effect to yell, and you get them moving their ass, you get them doing their job. But, but generally speaking, I'm not a yeller. Trump's relationship with Marla Maples, to some, seems much different from his marriage to Ivana, which friends likened to more of a business partnership. There's no doubt that Donald Trump would rather see his second wife stay at home with their new daughter, Tiffany. I have more respect for a great homemaker as a wife than I do as a wife who's a good wife and a good business person. I have far more respect for a homemaker because in many respects I think it's tougher. I think it's a lot harder to beautifully bring up a family. Most women would agree with me. He can still be controversial and doesn't pull punches when expressing his opinions, but he seemed to grow more reflective after reaching his 45th birthday, something that shows in both his public and private life. The image of me is being like a flamethrower, and I think the actual fact is that I'm much different than that. I think that I'm, I'm not a mean guy at all. I think I might be just the opposite. I'm not somebody that can be pushed around. I don't want to be pushed around. I don't allow people to push me around. 
And I've caught him even singing a little song to Tiffany uh, just a couple of days ago when Mar Lago, he thought I was out of the room and he was just doing this song. He was just like making up this song and the words to it as he was going and it was so cute. It just broke my heart. In business, though, Donald Trump is the same brash, hard-driving guy who persuaded New York officials he could do the impossible at the Commodore Hotel. He has a vision that most people don't have. In my view, that's his real genius. There are a lot of people who can put up a building, but more important than that is, is the vision that makes the building different, exciting, or that even dreams up the concept, the original concept. That, that's, that's where he... He's better than almost anyone else. Okay, everything good? Well you before reaching 50, Donald Trump had accomplished more than virtually anyone else in his field, and he wasn't stopping. After years of trying, in June 1994, he announced financing for his Riverside Park project had been obtained from investors in Hong Kong. It was one more sign that Trump's celebrity status had never waned, indeed that it was growing again. Look back to the 30s. And look at the movies they made in the 30s. It was Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire dancing around these palaces. Everybody else was like broke in a flat trying to like have enough money to, to, put spaghetti, to put ketchup on spaghetti. And they were making these movies because it was such bad economic times. Well, you know, Donald is that in bad economic times. And we're going through some bad economic times. Donald is Fred Astaire. I mean, he's the, the mogul living up on the mountain who's got these gambling casinos and beautiful blondes and you know it's everybody's kind of dream of, of the 90s sort of version of James Bond. While most people keep it quiet, hide under a rock with this kind of success, Donald is screaming to the world, look what I've done and I'm having fun and I hope you're having fun watching. And he's making it a lot of fun for everybody. Making it fun for everybody means never hiding from the cameras. Two months after Trump and Marla had a daughter, Tiffany, they were married with media attention befitting a royal couple at his Plaza Hotel. Despite their past troubles, they appeared to be typical newlyweds. Marla once said to me, you know, Linda, you can't help who you fall in love with. It's not always easy, but you just can't help who you fall in love with. And he really loves her, too. I mean, he has a much softer side than, than most of the world sees which, thank goodness, I see uh, quite a bit. And uh, it's not, he's not someone that's going to come in and say, honey, I'll cook tonight. <laughs> you take a breather. <laughs> or let me change this diaper because you've been working all day with the baby and I know you're busy. The somewhat quieter, even more successful Donald Trump still seems to have politics in the back of his mind. But business is the order of the day. And more gentle or not, he is first and foremost a competitor. Everybody wants me to run for office. Polls are taken that show that I win when I run. It's just not my thing. I'm too honest. I'm too forthright. I think there's a level of honesty and almost a level of dishonesty that it takes to be a great politician. I'm just too straight. I think Donald is a, is a real meat and potatoes, all-American, apple pie kind of guy. I mean, he likes... Uh, he likes meat and potatoes, literally. I mean, there's, there's, no, there, there's nothing uh, uh, too quirky about Donald or nothing too secret, or he, he is what he appears to be. I've known stories where people have told me that this big limo will pull up to the, to the burger boy on the expressway, and he gets out and um, brings back burgers into the, into the limo, or Pizza Hut pizza back into the limo. Donald Trump says he always knew he'd do well, and the people around him say they always expected, as his father expected, that he'd succeed in business. But the roller coaster ride that took Trump to the top plunged him to the bottom, and that he's ridden back up still astonishes virtually everyone, including Trump himself. When you see all this, and then when people come up to you and grab at you and touch you and this and that, did I ever think it was going to be like that? No. In my wildest dreams, I never thought. In fewer than 50 years, Donald Trump has accomplished more as a businessman and developer than most will ever dream of. And it seems he's always looking for that next huge opportunity. Wherever there are new luxury skyscrapers to be built, new blockbuster deals to be made, and television cameras, you're likely to find Donald Trump.